Thank you. Yeah, so the title of my talk is Surveying the Commune Cloud, Joining Hands to Decentrally Process Decentralized Data. Um, so starting off, hi, uh, my name is Noah. You can find me on Twitter at underscore Atanapishtim. Atanapishtim is the uh, namesake OG for Noah. Um, so a quick kind of introduction or a preview of the structure of the talk. So I'm hoping to make it quick so that we can spend some more time discussing. And this is kind of like a great size of uh, a group of people to kind of talk about the ideas here. So part one of the talk is uh, going to be this thing called the cloud. What's its problem? Um, and then finally, what is a commune cloud? So just kind of getting into it, part one. So maybe a tentative definition, a good tentative definition would be something like the cloud is just a network of computers, and those computers are run in warehouse-sized buildings that we call data centers. We also probably can't get into them. So here's a picture of one such data center. This is uh, Google's data center in the Dallas, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, a little bit down the road from here. So there are the warehouses, some cooling systems. I think that's an electrical distribution system, but I really don't have any idea. Um, and your data is somewhere near there. You know, probably not. It's probably not there. Um, so what does it look like inside? It looks like this. Oh, and what's that? That's a network of computers. And here's a picture of them from above. This is a different data center. This is one in Iowa. And what's inside the computers? Compute resources. What are those? So I think a nice kind of non-technical definition is that computer resources are the means of digital production. They're the raw materials that programs require to run. And Google defines computer resources to be any physical or virtual component of limited availability within a computer system. So every device is a resource. Every internal system component is a resource. Kind of the short of it is that they're the sorts of things that computers are made up of. You know, some examples are things like CPUs, GPUs, non-durable and durable memory, NICs, pages, sockets, okay? And so maybe we can kind of like refine the definition of a cloud, and the cloud is just a network of compute resources. So here's a quick question. Who might have a computer? Here's an answer. These people, and they look so interesting. Who are they? Those are millennials. Uh, here's another quick question. Uh, who else might have a computer? Possibly also you. 77% of Americans have a, or own a smartphone, and a smartphone is a computer. So if you were to ask, you know, what's inside of a phone? Here's an example. Here's the iPhone 4S exposed. Um, it's got some compute resources inside of there. Yeah. Uh, and you might wonder if they're everywhere, and they are. So your laptop, compute resources. Desktop, compute resources. Tablets, compute resources. Your juicer compute resources, and I think that's them. Uh, I'm not positive that that's them, uh, but I think that's them. Okay, yeah, wow, right? These things are everywhere, and yes, they're ubiquitous. And this is kind of what they look like. This is a picture of their ubiquity. Okay, this is, I think, what Alan Kay called a selfie, the internet selfie. It's a picture of the internet. All these different lines show connections between different connected devices. And so remember when I said that the cloud is just a network of compute resources, well, it looks like the internet is that as well. So maybe the internet is a cloud, right? Substitution, okay, I don't, I don't think the internet is a cloud because I don't think a cloud is just a network of compute resources. So I think the cloud is maybe something better described as a network of compute resources that can be shared between the programs running on it, running on the resources, running on the cloud. So sharing is kind of a pretty important aspect here. So here's a picture of a cloud, maybe. Um, and here's a picture of the resources being shared. This is kind of like a static sharing of resources. So you see that none of the individual resources, none of the individual servers are kind of um, sharing resources between different programs on them. They're kind of MySQL gets this set of resources, Cassandra these, Memcache those. And so can also make things a little bit more dynamic, a little bit more fine-grained, where each individual application, each individual program can kind of be spread across, kind of given different resources. So if you've ever used something like AWS or GCE, and actually I have no idea how it works in GCE because I've never used it, but at least in AWS, you know, you can rent an instance and say I want, you know, one CPU and I want 
five gigabytes of RAM, and you can run your program that way. And so, you know, this thing seems so great with all the sharing. Yeah. And kind of it is. It is kind of great. Um, it's a pretty incredible system, and people are building really incredible systems on them, but it's also kind of not great. And so what's its problem? You know, this is a menacing cloud. Um, so this is a really great paper um, by Langdon Winner. It was written in 1980. Uh, it's called Do Artifacts Have Politics? And that's a really long quote, and I won't read it all here, but maybe the most important points are he distinguishes between the ways in which, two ways in which an artifact can have politics. So there's kind of um, intentional ways that an artifact can have politics. It can be designed with, you know, a certain uh, political purpose in mind. I don't know if anyone has heard of Robert Moses. Robert Moses, uh, I think back in the uh, 20th century, is largely responsible for the structure that uh, New York City has. And <clears throat> he designed, designed these arches on the parkways that he would build to only be nine feet tall. And the reason he did this is because he wanted people who were able to purchase cars to be able to drive out to the beaches on Long Island, but he didn't want any buses to be able to go out there. Uh, yeah, and so it was largely inspired by his, you know, serious racial prejudice. So that's one explicit way in which, you know, um, an, an artifact or a technology can have politics. But there are other sorts of ways. Um, and before going into that, I think uh, one of the things he points out is that <clears throat> there's an impact that an artifact has after it's kind of been enacted. So after a society or a community chooses to adopt a certain technology, the implications are kind of long-lasting afterwards. And so there's a, a section here where he says, you know, in that sense, technological innovations are similar to legislative acts or political founds that establish a framework for public order that will in, uh, ensue, I spelled that, over many generations. Okay, and so he also says here, the issues that divide or unite people in society are settled not only in the institutions and practices of politics proper, but also and less obviously in tangible arrangements of steel and concrete, wires and transistors, nuts and bolts, and we could also say today, right, compute resources. And so less obviously, you know, I think maybe obviously. Um, yeah, and so um, the other thing I want to kind of draw attention to is when he talks about technologies as ways of building order, you can also maybe translate that as you know, technologies are ways of distributing power. Um, and so what are like maybe the cloud politics? Or what's cloud power? I think it's pretty clearly the politics of centralization. So your data is centralized. Um, and I can't see the notes from Google Slides here, but um, one of the questions I wanted to ask is, <clears throat> you know, there's maybe like a normative or philosophical sense in which we think the data is ours, like it's our property maybe in some way. But I think there's a much more important question to ask, which is, is it really ours if in practice we don't have control over it, we don't know where it is, we don't know who's using it, we don't know um, what they're using it for. Um, you know, can it really be called yours? Can, and especially can it really be called yours if it's being used to maybe like change your behavior? So there's a talk given a few weeks ago by this guy, Tumas Hendrik Ilves. Yeah, I think that's how you say his name. He's the ex-president of Estonia. He gave a talk at Stanford called um, liberal democracy in the digital age. And in it, he kind of surveys the election, the events leading up to the election, discussing things like the hacking that took place, um, the spreading of people's emails, talk about the, talks about the impact that it has, mentions um, the fact that there are some vo voter election rolls that were hacked. You know, it's just the data of who lives where and kind of talks about what that is. But one of the things he brings up is this company Cambridge Analytica. And Cambridge Analytica attempts to use data to target uh, electoral advertisements at potential uh, voters. They try and build, you know, like, a, I think he describes it as by kind of uh, scraping people's Facebook likes. They build kind of like a personality profile of them and then target uh, electoral advertisements at them using that information. Um, oh, another important thing is that it's largely funded by this guy, Robert Mercer, who is a huge Trump supporter. There's a really good New Yorker 
article on that. And so, I mean, you know, you could ask yourself the question of whether something like this is humane, you know, whether it's reflective of the kind of society that we think is healthy and the kind of society that we want to live in. Um, and I think even if you do think it's humane, maybe you think that, for example, this is the right of, like, you know, the free, free market. I'm not necessarily trying to take issue with something like that, but maybe you think it's, it's humane because this is what people using their freedom to create do with it. But I think it's still reasonable to be able to ask whether there are alternatives. Okay, so maybe there are alternatives. Maybe if the problem is centralization, maybe if it's a structural problem, then maybe the way and the place to look is something like decentralization. So that kind of brings me to the question of what is a commune cloud. Okay, so I think it's this, um, which is what I use to define uh, a cloud before. And, you know, don't we already have that? Well, this is what it looks like today. And this is what I think or maybe hope or it looks like maybe tomorrow. So maybe instead of commune where it sounds like an ah, it's more like an ah, like commune. So four theses about it. So it's not a programming language or a programming language runtime. I think whatever a commune cloud ends up being, it should be able to share fine-grained compute resources on consumer devices. It should be able to identify consumer devices with their owners. Um, and it should allow owners to arbitrarily federate and defederate devices. Like you should be able to share your resources with others, you know, collect your resources together, uh, maybe be able to you know, build clouds that are the size of your home, maybe the size of your neighborhood, you know, start to extend them out to you know, different sections of your city, basically like cloud-free association. It's not like cloud composition. And you might think, well, this is kind of foolish because there are maybe massive security concerns, things like botnets, right? I mean, the idea here is that you should be able to do anything that you can already do in the cloud, just do it on consumer devices. And maybe that's a little naive. Maybe there are certain things that you can't do on consumer devices that you can do up in a place like um, AWS in EC2. Um, and I want to come back to the topic of botnets a little later, but I think that's... That's an important concern. The one thing I will say is that um, if you use a browser, then you run arbitrary computation like all day long. You know, as long as you're browsing, you didn't write that HTML. You don't know who wrote that HTML. You also didn't write the JavaScript, and you don't know who wrote the JavaScript. And the reason why this is safe is because Chrome has a pretty sophisticated sandboxing mechanism. And there are a bunch of different ways to sandbox processes. It's not just uh, the way that Chrome does it. And so I think that there's a lot of promise in maybe engaging those alternatives um, to see what could be done kind of in general, in the general case for running computers. I also might think it's kind of dumb because we already have something like this. We don't really need it. And it's definitely vaporware. It definitely does not exist. And I don't have a demo, but I do want to point out some things that I think are like or have some properties that are kind of nice or desirable and whatever might become something like a commune cloud. And so one of them are, are botnets. You know, so um, there's this botnet that I think is still around today. I think it's only about 85,000 hosts today. But circa 2007 had between 1 to 50 million hosts at its height. You know, had enough collective bandwidth to knock small countries off the internet. This is a quote from a um, anti-spam researcher at Message Labs in 2007. Uh, but if you added up all of the 500 top supercomputers of 2007, it blew them away with only, you know, what is that, 1 25th of its uh, machines. Um, and this is actually another major issue, I think, with the kinds of systems that we have set up. So uh, because it's so access to get, or because it's relatively easy to get access to resources for malicious purposes, it means that if you say run your own email server, right, and you become the target of an attack like this, like what are your options? Your only options are really to kind of flee into the domain of say a Google um, because they have the resources, they have the infrastructure to be able to mitigate those kinds of attacks. And I saw an article um, just this past week that Google will now uh, offer legal protection to startups um, in exchange, or startups who are being kind of trolled by patent trolls in exchange for equity. So it's kind of a weird world that um, I think application development and maybe kind of development in general is leading into where 
these platforms are almost becoming, you know, something that we're dependent on to provide certain kinds of foundational services. And I think it's only going to increase kind of this centralization, maybe the the cage the cages around us, maybe something like a new fiefdom, you know, where you're sharecropping it out on you know a bunch of Google hosts. So there's also all of these at home projects that you might be familiar with, things like SETI at home. It's composed, these are like volunteer computing projects, executes a bunch of different signal processing jobs. Uh, not too impressive, but this one is pretty impressive, folding at home. It's composed of a bunch of volunteer nodes as well, uh, using heterogeneous resources like both GPUs and CPUs. And I think currently it is the world's second fastest uh, computer. Um, you know, it's been super beneficial to the scientific community, you know, allowing researchers to run these computationally costly atomic level simulations and it's produced 129 scientific research papers. I don't know how relevant that is. I came from the humanities where the average readership for the paper was about like 15 people. So I don't know if 129 scientific research papers is a, you know, just 129 times 15 people reading them, but it seems pretty important. Um, and then there's also all these other decentralized applications and things are kind of starting to get a little exciting today. So these are kind of some examples of them. So that, which I think this fellow here and maybe those two people back there are involved in building is a package manager, called a package manager for data. Um, under the covers, there's a couple different node modules, hyper, ar hyper archive, right? And then hyper core. Um, and people are building really interesting things on top of them, like this one right beneath that is hypervision and that's kind of P2P live streaming or decentralized live streaming, decentralized Twitch. You've got things like IPFS and IPFS is a little sneaky actually. So IPFS released, um, or I guess the, the first full release of this library called libp2p, which is kind of the underlying peer-to-peer -peer networking infrastructure. And there's like a really small section where they talk about resource discovery and they mention things like CPUs, they mention things like memory that um, you should be able to discover these resources on the uh, IPFS network, so maybe IPFS is kind of, you know, going to be building something like what I'm talking about, I don't know. I know that Ethereum, which is this um, kind of menacing uh, diamond, um, there's something like a runtime for that, so you can kind of run programs, execute programs on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, Bitcoin, obviously everybody knows Bitcoin. This uh, wheat multicolored wheat here. This is Democracy Earth. They're building something called Sovereign, uh, which is, um, I think, an attempt at decentralized democracy. It's democracy on a blockchain. Uh, that's a really interesting like, project. I think it's a really important project. The democracy, the form of democracy that they advocate for is something called delegative democracy. I don't know if anybody here has ever heard of delegative democracy, but basically what it is is every individual on every issue is given a vote. And you can either choose to delegate your vote to someone else or vote on an issue directly. So it's kind of a hybrid form of direct and representative, representational democracy. Um, and the people behind it actually started a party in um, Buenos Aires, in Argentina, and campaigned uh, on the idea that you know you kind of put them in power and then they'll build, they'll kind of deploy this application and give it everyone all their constituents access to it, and then all their constituents can kind of. It's almost a way of kind of hacking, you know, representational democracy and kind of layering over top of it this um, um, delegative or fluid uh, democracy on top of it. There's Patch Bay. This is like um, decentralized Twitter, Facebook, you know, for hippies, maybe not exclusively for hippies. There's a lot of hippies on there. There are people who seem like hippies. That's not meant as a judgment. That's meant as like you know, high esteem. And then the last one here is Orbit, um, this circle. Uh, series of circles, and that's something like decentralized Slack. And there's many, many more. I mean, it's really exciting. And the thing I kind of just want to point out about them is for the most part, and I could be wrong, is that this kind of resource sharing is already going on. Okay, so it's just implicit. It's, it's kind of hidden behind the application semantics. And I think that it's really important to kind of pull that resource sharing, resource allocation, resource delegation out from behind, you know, this kind of... Um, or make it explicit at least, raise it up to the first level. And so this isn't any stuff that's original. 
read a whole lot of other things about it. This um, uh, Alexandros Marianos, Mar uh, Marinos is the founder of Resin. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Resin. Um, this is Browser Cloud. Um, this is one of the lead developers on IPFS. This was, I think, their master's thesis. Q-Machine is a really interesting project that I haven't seen a lot of talk about, but Q-Machine is um, kind of like a supercomputer on top of um, web browsers as well. Yeah, that's it. So five minutes, but maybe we can talk a little bit. Thank you.